What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest on December 18th with Mr. Peter Todd to discuss his opinion on how we should just raise the uh, the supply limit of Bitcoin because it's broken without a finite supply. So we're just going to put him on the spot right now and roast him over that. <laughs> glad to uh, glad to be on. It, it, in all seriousness, though, um, I. This is going to be picking his brain about open timestamps and not arguing supply caps. But, um, you know, we Careful, because I'll, I'll seriously argue for them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we also have Janine with us, as usual, as well as Mr. Chris Ellis. So what's going on, guys? Hey. Did we lose a Janine? I think we might have done. Hello. Hey. Woo! So... What exactly is open timestamps, Peter? What what's the point of it? Well, I mean the point of it's basically that uh the bad guys don't have time machines and open timestamps let you prove things existed prior to some point in the past. And where that kind of, you know, is useful is essentially because very frequently you can rule out attacks by just showing that something was old enough. Mm -hmm. And so pretty much, um, you know, to kind of give some context to this, um, you know, you made this back in, I want to say 2015, 16, is that right? Yeah, the protocol that, um, you know, open time, like sort of the current version of open timestamps dates back from uh, about 2016, if I remember correctly, although I actually started the project way back in about 2012 i uh you know just kind of didn't uh didn't have a need to go work on it for a while and then i finally uh, got around to actually uh you know getting it into sort of a production ready uh version do you have a timestamp to prove that <laughs> i i would actually I, I i can go dig some up although the, the interesting thing about that of course is that gets to uh, what exactly do timestamps mean <laughs> well, I think real quick, um, you know, maybe we should touch on um, what the difference is between open timestamps and just naively peppering the entire blockchain with um, op return outputs for single things. Well, in terms of what it actually proves, not that much of a difference. Um, but in terms of how expensive it is, there's a very big difference. And you know, I, I, I think the thing is to say, like, time stamping things with Bitcoin is a fair bit older than open timestamps. But what, what open timestamps really does is it makes it very, very cheap. You know, essentially, the only cost in open timestamps to do a timestamp is essentially, you know, the tiny bit of bandwidth. And the way it achieves that is through centralized infrastructure that just aggregates request to timestamp things into gigantic Merkle trees. And the beauty of that, of course, is well, Merkle tree can be as big as you want it to be. Would you say it's a fair statement to say that um, if you aren't playing with Bitcoin UTXOs, there's no such thing as a block size? Um, mostly, yeah. Well, in the case of uh, open timestamps, yes. Um, I could quibble about some other t protocols, but certainly for open timestamps, I mean... You know, it, it really does scale as much as you want it. And uh, just as an example, you know, I've personally timestamped with open timestamps in one Bitcoin transaction, about half a billion documents once, which is um, when I, you know, had, had my project to go timestamp uh, as much as possible of the Internet Archive. But did you Merkleize it first or did you individually timestamp each document? Well, the thing is, with open timestamps, both those statements are the same. Ah, right? Okay. Because the, you know, the way the system works is essentially, you know, there's a couple of different levels to it, but, but essentially Merkle trees are getting built of every single thing anyone wants to timestamp in some period. And because a Merkle tree can be as big as you want it to be, well, that's what allows it to go scale. Right, but and, other, pro other projects were 
um, reducing costs by batching files together using some proprietary, you know, software on the front end that the user interfaced with. But then on the back end, it was time stamping lumps of documents. And the part of the problem with that is that, as you know, and you probably explain it better than I can, the sequence of the documents depends on, you know, the Merkle root depends on the sequence with which you you uh, hash those documents, right? So in order to get the, the, the Merkle root back again, you have to know the order in which the documents were hashed. And that's another yeah. data point that you need to remember. Yeah. Well, like, this, so, you know, part of the trade-off with open timestamps, and I think it's a very minor trade-off, um, compared to just using one UTXO per document, is that in open timestamps, you get an open timestamps proof. And that proof is a file containing, you know, essentially a series of mathematical operations, and those are followed in sequence to get to a Bitcoin block. Now, the, the proof is what allows it to go scale, because the data necessary for any individual document is con contained in that proof. But... It does mean, of course, you lose the proof. Well, you know, there goes your ability to go prove the document. But I mean, I wouldn't even call that much of a, you know, much of a problem because, after all, if you lose a document, you lose the ability to go prove it existed anyway. So, you know, you already got to go store something. Storing a very well, tiny, like one k timestamp file, isn't a big deal. It can also be the version of the document, like a Word document, a user changes it without realizing that it would actually change the hash. I've seen that happen to people before. Yeah, and that's why Open Timestamps uh, has Git support built in, so that you can timestamp Git repositories but, you know, as of a particular version. Mm -hmm. And part of the whole way that you kind of solve <clears throat> like the, the scalability of this on the tech side um, is kind of the division between the attestation server and the calendar servers that you run. So like kind of, you want to like break down the thought process between kind of segregating those two different backend operations and how this kind of makes things a, a little more flexible in terms of a quick stamp proof and then the Merkle proof when it's confirmed and so on. Yeah. Well, so a lot of um, pre-existing things, they, had this problem where creating a timestamp wasn't a one-step operation. And, you know, why that matters is, well, I mean, Git's a great example, where if I want to timestamp a Git commit, I want to just add that timestamp to the commit itself, store it, and then I'm done. And then when I need to revalidate it, that might be, you know, 10 years down the road, you know, five years down the road. I mean, it's, you want this to be one step to create the timestamp, one step to go and validate it, if you ever do, many years later. And the issue with that is, well, Bitcoin transactions, of course, aren't instant. You know, it can take hours for a cheap Bitcoin transaction to go through. And, of course, I'm not going to pay a ton of money uh, on the open timestamp servers, so they use very low fees. And what that means is you then have to have some sort of intermediate thing. Because you want the process from request a timestamp to get a timestamp proof to complete in about a second. And the way open timestamp achieves that is with something called a calendar. And the idea with that is a calendar contains tips of Merkle trees that are sort of, in a sense, ephemeral. So the way that works is every second, it's batching up all the timestamp requests in that past second, creating a Merkle tree out of that, then storing the tip of that Merkle tree permanently, while then giving back timestamp proofs leading to that permanently stored tip. And then the second operation is that those tips of Merkle trees are then joined into bigger Merkle trees, and those get timestamped. So by being two steps, it lets you solve this latency issue while still eventually you know, getting your timestamp back. And what this means is, well, the calendar server creates this calendar data structure, and anyone with a copy of that calendar data structure can validate all timestamps ever made using that server. So long story short, it essentially gets you the best of both worlds, and because the calendar data structure is um, fixed in size, or really it, it grows by a fixed amount per second, it's feasible for anyone to get a copy of that. You know, it's at most would ever be, uh, you know, on the order of gigabytes. 
Yeah, so it's kind of like um, <clears throat> rather than sit around and wait for the, the next block to come in, you just get a proof from the authority of the calendar server, which is periodically batched in. So you can get that right away and then just come back at some point and get the entire Merkle proof to the blockchain if you want to hold that locally instead of depend on this calendar server to verify things. Yeah, although I'll point out um, authority isn't quite the right word there because calendar servers, the only thing that you're trusting them to do is to eventually perform that proof. And if you don't bother keeping a backup of that data yourself to you know, have a copy of that data around. But the moment you get a copy of that, you know, it has nothing to do with trust anymore. It, all the actual time stamping goes back to Bitcoin. Or right, maybe notary would be a better term. Well, I, got, I, mean, I don't like the word notary either because notary ah. in traditional sense is a trusted service. And it also does a lot more than time stamping. You know, in the legal sense, most of what a notary does is actually to validate who is being, you know, who is doing something. You know, you can't just like give a notary a document and say, you know, put your stamp on it. The notary actually wants you to be there and interact with them in some way. Just, you know, validate like, is this the person I, you know, whose signature is on there? Um, you know, do they look like they were coerced? Things like that. You know, something that's actually, if anything, uh, crypto really fundamentally can't do because computer software can't tell whether or not you were coerced. Well, then I'm going to have to take issue with the fact of you referring to Bitcoin as the notary um, in, in your original open timestamps write up. <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, in, 20, in uh, 2012, I uh, certainly got some terms wrong and uh you know, it's it's kind of unfortunate with a lot of this stuff because the the terminology does overlap things. It'd be nice if there was a term that was more clear, you know. And like in the Open Time Sense Protocol, I mean, I use the term notary to refer to the trusted things that actually um, perform that uh, you know timestamp. But I mean, let's face it, like it's not a good term. <laughs> I, I wish I could say otherwise. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be a stickler for, for terms in, in correct sense, then yeah. Yeah, you know, it's uh, in computer science, uh, what's the, what do they say? The hardest things are um, off by one errors and uh, yeah, the three hardest things are a na na name and validation, like caching or something. <laughs> yep. All righty. So I think we've, we've kind of broken down the, the core of the nuts and bolts under the hood. So uh, what, what exactly is a timestamp good for and what is it not good for? Because uh, there is a, a big shortcoming in open timestamps uh, from where I'm standing that doesn't degrade its value but makes it completely useless for an entire category of problems. Yep, there absolutely is. And, uh, you, you know, timestamping, I think, is one of these things where people think it's a lot stronger than it is and the i mean probably one of the examples you see that you see most often is people thinking you can usefully um time stamp things like tweets in that by itself you know um being secure and you know why that can be problematic is you got, you got to remember a timestamp is free you know because time open timestamps is so scalable you have this problem in certain applications where since the timestamp is free. Uh-oh, we lost Ooh. a Peter. I really wanted that little nugget there. Do, 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 do. Bear with me while I try to get him back. Yeah, no worries. So, I mean, how fucked up is it that a Bitcoiner wants to raise the 21 million cap, though? Like, seriously, what the fuck? Yeah, let's get into that at the end. Not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter, got your back. All right. Sorry, where, where did I cut off there? How hmm. things being very cheap makes lots of problems for some things. All right, let me, uh, yeah, let me go over that again. So the, the irony with open timestamps is because it's scalable and timestamps are effectively free, that actually makes them useless for applications where someone could go and just brute force all the possible things they might want to timestamp. 
Um, a great example being so, like a stock prediction. You know, I want to be, uh, I want to go prove how smart I am. So I go and predict that some stock will be some price in the future. But I prove that I was right by just time stamping my prediction. And then I just go and make in advance files predicting every single possible price. You know, in a, a situation like that, a timestamp really doesn't add any value because, you know, in advance, I can just timestamp every single possible thing. Another good example where timestamps don't add as much value as you might expect is when you're timestamping things that are inherently incriminating. You know, so suppose you want to go and show that some politician, you know, made some tweet and that tweet said something horrible. Well, at the moment when the tweet was created, it was obviously horrible. So you could have just faked that. You know, where a timestamp would add value is if at the creation that tweet was wasn't known to mean anything. Although even then you tweets are small, so you still might run into this brute forcing issue. Mm -hmm. So it's Effectively, just this thing existed. It shows nothing about the correctness of something or the fact that there are no other conflicting statements. It, it does not address the double spend problem. Just exactly. this exists. Yeah, that's exactly true. And, you know, not addressing the double spend problem, that's kind of fundamental to the way it scales. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> I don't even know how to start on how a, a attestation server, a calendar server would even begin to try to validate things like that with the different types of complex semantics of everything people would want to timestamp. Yeah, and I'd say the advice I'd kind of give with open timestamps is because it's free, it's hard for it to make things worse. But you should, but you have to think carefully whether or not it actually made anything better. So it sounds like it, that the applicability of something like this is certainly useful for things like legal documents, for example, but perhaps slightly less useful for things uh, like that require context, like in journalism, where you know you can timestamp a particular tweet, but without the context, it perhaps isn't as relevant. You could sort of carve out your own narrative, if you like, you know, just with the with the timestamps. I mean, I'm not even sure I'd, I would say that. I would, I would more say, you know, in, in the case of some legal situations, the timestamp could be very useful. In other cases, it might not be. Same thing as I think with uh, journalism. It, it really depends on exactly what, what the situation is and what exactly you timestamped. And also I'd say, I mean, timestamps in many cases won't be the only form of proof. You know, it will be some proof in some context. Um, you know, just to give a very simple um, cryptographic example, one of the very clear use cases for timestamps is timestamping digital signatures. And the reason why that's useful is because if a private key gets leaked later, if you can rule out, well, if you can say that the private key leaked only happened after some point in time, timestamps on signatures before that point in time let you still validate those signatures even after the compromise. You know, and Bitcoin Core is, you know, as itself actually winds up using this because it, you know, many of the contributors use open timestamps to timestamp their Git commits and thus their PGP signatures on it. But you notice how you have to make that, you know, you have to kind of have this extra bit of context, right? The timestamp by itself didn't prove that the commit was real. Rather, it helped prove in conjunction with a digital signature that it was real. You know, it was one piece of evidence in that puzzle. Mm -hmm. So pretty much you can layer on um, effectively identity layers in addition to the timestamps and use those as building more corroborating evidence for the truthfulness of something which the timestamp can't do on its own. Yeah, it, 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 and I wouldn't just say it's, it's always going to be identity layers, but certainly in the case of uh, Git commits that are you know PHP signed. That's effectively an identity system. Well, th this kind of goes down a rabbit hole of many of the numerous things I think you could add on to open timestamps in terms of extensions. Like with the current architecture now, you've already effectively split the actual blockchain attestation and the more granular calendar attestations into different functions and different services. I mean, 
could you not do a similar thing in terms well, of and, reputation um, based notaries? L- 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 let me go point out a technical note, by the way. In actual implementation right now, the calendars and the um, aggregation are actually the same server, but they, they can easily be separated. And uh, there is um, one implementation that does actually um, separate them, but that's not actually the one that runs. But, mm-hmm. but you, know, you know, the, the w- point I'm making, though, is like the abstract separation of functions. Like you could extend another one with identity-based notaries that are actually signing off um, on the validity of the contents they're verifying with some means of validation and actually kind of have those identity-based notaries attach their own subtrees to the, the greater open timestamp time tree and kind of create a structured silo under that where you can attempt to, within some trust model, deal with double spend or verification issues just based on the identity of that notary. Well, so... The way I'd I'd put it is, the moment you have some kind of um, attestation to validity, then I think the right approach to that is really approach it as as its own thing. When appropriate, use timestamp proofs as a part of that, rather than, I I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, the way you're describing that is as though that kind of sits underneath open timestamps, when really those kind of systems that have some kind of notion of validity, they tend to be things that really have to be developed separately as their own system. And the time stamping part of that would just be, you know, some module that kind of plugs in. But in terms of just double spins, um, another project of mine, Proof Marshall, is attempting to, among other things, create a way of preventing double spins that is um, kind of general in the sense that what the, the primitive proof marshal wants to give you is something I'm calling a single use seal, which is similar to a cryptographic pub key pr- private key pair, but with a single use seal it has this sort of magical non mathematical property that you can't sign twice, or the terminology of uh, call a seal, you can't close the seal twice. And Obviously, this can't be done with math alone, but notice how Bitcoin transaction can only be spent um, once. So Bitcoin transaction output can be used to implement a single-use seal. I was actually going to ask you if that was related to uh, one-use seals, because I have never heard that term proof marshal before. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's uh, my uh, rather incomplete and uh, slow-moving project, but... uh, what I'm aiming to do is essentially create a library to let you build data structures that work well with these kind of uh, use cases. And you know, the, the single use seal um, concept, that's sort of one of the things that I want Marshall to support well. And where you would wind up using that is, for example, to you know, create attestation chains or you know, things like that. You know, suppose, for instance, in one of your uh, notary examples, your true notary examples, who uh, goes and attests to the validity of something, you might want to be able to go and, you know, provide proof that here is a full set of things they've attested to, to let other people audit, well, you know, did you ever attest to anything that was false? And that full set, you could then implement that with single-use seals, so that you kind of start off with one, you know, one seal and create a chain of them and then anyone can go and validate by sort of validating every step in that chain the fact that they have the full set of uh, that data actually would you mind breaking down for the listeners and i'm not going to lie myself um the mechanics of how a one use seal works it's actually been quite a while since i watched your presentation on that and i'm kind of blanking on the the mechanics yeah so the the sort of um, API side of it, you know, the sort of abstraction side of it, is you have this uniquely identifiable seal, and you can close that seal over a message, exactly producing a witness to the fact that it was closed. 
And if the seal protocol is secure, then closing that seal should only be able to happen once. And the message should be uniquely that a particular transaction output. Yeah, is shit. I, I hate to cut you off, Peter, and but we're kind of having a is, lag issues. <laughs> oh. All right. Let me. Uh, here, where, where did I cut off? Uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds ago, talking about the API structure. All right. Voice check. All right. Can you hear me? All right. One, loud two, and clear. Three. We lost you around the statement API structure. Yeah. So the API. Um, abstraction of a single use seal is effectively that you have something called a, a seal and it's uniquely identifiable and you can close the seal over a message. Now when you close it over a message you get a witness which is just another bit of data attesting to the fact that a particular seal was closed over a particular message. And if a single use seal protocol or really I should say implementation is secure that operation should be able to happen exactly once. You know, not twice. Now, to get a little less abstract, well, how would you actually implement this? The simplest way is to say that a particular Bitcoin transaction output is a seal, and your witness is just a transaction spending that output with uh, an op return output designating, you know, the hash of the message that it was closed over. And since a Bitcoin transaction output can only be spent once, that single use seal protocol is secure. All right. And now how does this tag into using open timestamps as a verification mechanism for that? Well, you know, it really doesn't because open timestamps fundamentally can't prove that thing. But, you know, where they're kind of related is I think in sort of a more abstract sense of just the fact that, you know, we're going back to Bitcoin um, to, you know, to go and implement these things. And maybe... The other bit of relation is, well, an obvious question there is, how do you make a single-use seal protocol um, efficient? Because obviously, if it's just one Bitcoin transaction output per seal, you're going to need a lot of Bitcoin transaction outputs. But to scale single-use seals, we can actually, again, use Merkle trees, although in a different fashion. See, open timestamps uses a Merkle tree from bottom up, if you will. That is, a Mer uh, open time set proof starts at the very bottom of a Merkle tree and then works its way upwards. Whereas to scale single use seals, you actually want to work from the top down. And the way you do that is say, well, rather than have a seal be directly Bitcoin transaction output, what if it's proof that a signature for a particular pub key wasn't published in some data structure? And if that data structure consists of a linear chain of Merkle trees indexed by you know, PubKey, then you can verify without having the full set of data that a particular PubKey doesn't have a valid signature, followed by then having a valid signature, extracting all of the parts of those Merkle trees corresponding to that particular PubKey. So pretty much a canonically ordered um, Merkle tree rather than just a, a rolling um, disorganized one like open timestamps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, because in the open timestamps proofs, you know, those, that proof format doesn't actually know Merkle trees exist. I mean, it doesn't even know Bitcoin transactions exist. It just blindly follows a sequence of operations. And, and those operations may or may not actually be a Merkle tree. But if you constrain it much, much more rigidly, then you have something which, you know, really forces a single path in a particular way down Merkle trees. And then that's what allows you to, um, to constrain it tightly enough that double spins are impossible. So random um, left turn here. Are, are you aware of the uh, mainstay protocol uh, that Commerce Block created? Uh, it's, the name sounds familiar, but I, I mean, there's been so many, so many of these kind of protocols. So I don't remember the exact detail of that one. It's pretty much the idea of having a 
infinitely sized Merkle tree time stamped in a transaction just like open timestamp. But the the difference is in mainstay, um, you kind of have a sort of consensus rule to the transaction committing to the timestamps. And that's that um, it has to move forward linearly with no more than a single output. So you, you can add new inputs, but any instance of a transaction in the chain with more than one output invalidates the uh, everything that it's committing to. And then the structure of the Merkle tree is actually canonically organized so that people can effectively purchase slots that you can have inclusion proofs for, um, you know, on both sides. So you can see um, to some degree that nothing conflicting was committed to under this slot and effectively guarantee, um, you know, for each slot that's registered with this transaction chain, um, that there is only one state, one commitment to any sub branch of the tree and kind of pr pretty much in my mind, it's just restructuring open timestamps to be able to address the double spend problem. I would disagree with that statement. And the Ooh. reason is I would not like what you described um, as a time, you know, as a timestamp transaction, I would not call it timestamp. The the moment you're kind of putting those kind of rules on it, I don't think the term timestamp is a good one. I would actually say that they're pretty, you know, what they've done is pretty close to a single use seal. And yes, I mean, everything you just described there makes total sense. Um, you know, I think the single use seal concept has advantages with flexibility and whatnot. But in terms of security. You know, implemented properly, they should be absolutely identical. And uh, also implemented properly, uh, mainstay should, certainly should scale. It's probably going to be a little less convenient for certain types of applications. But, you know, these are kind of low-level tech details, not like fundamental issues. Well, it's kind of where, like, looking at the two things together, like, goes in my mind. I mean, what reason is there that you couldn't say operate a mainstay implementation that has a designated slot to take unordered open timestamps type commitments for that one slot and commit to that as well as canonically ordered enforced um, subtrees in the same transaction. Well, I mean, the thing with open timestamps is because the proof format is general, you know, there is absolutely no technical re you know, reason why I couldn't go write a you know calendar server that actually did that to background. You know that would just be a money saving thing. Um, you know the disadvantage would be the proofs would be a little bit bigger, but you know from a validity point of view, the open time sense clients wouldn't even know. So it, it's just I, I guess you know I would say that considerations like that are really um, implementation details, precisely because. Open timestamps, you know, doesn't have the notions of validity that uh, make any of that actually relevant. You know, similarly, in actual open timestamps implementation, I have I've changed the transaction um, format multiple times just to you know save a little bit more money on transaction fees. Again, the clients don't care. You know, the proof format has no idea what a transaction is, so exactly how you get the timestamps is really not very relevant. I mean, from the point of view of auditability, but, you know, I, I don't know, like, ever since you've published the the original write-up on open timestamps, Peter, I have been obsessed with the concept of this as a protocol, and it boggles my mind that, like, it, it's almost just glossed over everywhere in the space. Like, the potential of open timestamps as just an extension of Bitcoin is, in my mind, this could just be a new protocol or suite of protocols on the internet, like HTTP, like FTP, like the, the usefulness, as long as you understand the limitations and what they can and cannot do, it is enormous. But <laughs> like it's still just such a niche thing as far as what people talk about and look at in this space. Well, I, I think the reason why that you know that that's the case is because 
actual security that actually works isn't necessarily all that glamorous and doesn't necessarily make people a lot of money. You know, open timestamps is great because it's essentially free, actually scales, you know, doesn't require a token, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, none of these things are good for hyping up your company to go sell your, uh, you know, latest ICO token. Eh, touche, but I mean, there's just so much stuff you can build. I mean, you know, kind of, kind of, let's take a shift here and we, we can talk about fun stuff like that. But, um, you know, the, the first idea that has popped into my head um, has always been a decentralized internet archive. And I'm, I'm going to get a little tin foily down a little side hole here for a second. But if you're familiar with the plugin TLS notary um, that broke, I think, in the, the last few years, that used to actually allow you to play games in the web browser API and feed the site itself as part of the TLS handshake to get a signature on that that could be used to timestamp. And if you put all of these things together, you could just have a decentralized provable internet archive. I could have gotten the TLS signature, timestamped that, save the timestamp with a local copy of the website, but all the web browsers out there broke the API that lets you play with the TLS handshake at that low of a level. Well, and also, um, I mean, they may, have be, they may have come up with a way to fix this issue, but as I recall, TLS Notary actually did require a trusted third party. Um, the trusted third party didn't need to actually see the data, but... You know, essentially due to the way the crypto worked, the trusted third party had to be trusted to perform some mathematical operation in the TLS uh, handshake to actually make any of this work. But you, you could effectively replace that since that's been broken with, um, you know, an authority like Internet Archive. Um, if they had an identity key to sign off on things that were archived with them and then a local copy was downloaded like effectively with a similar trust model, you can do the same kind of thing. Well, uh, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is the difference is ideally we want to fully decentralize things where websites actually sign their contents. But since we can't quite do that, we'll have to have a centralized but distributed model. And, you know, long story short, though, is I certainly agree with you that it would be nice to have a web archiver that rather than just store it on a web page, actually gives you a signed bit of data, you know, a signed archive. Indeed, I probably could do that for open timestamps and just have, a, you know, have as part of that project a trusted server that just gives you back. A, I mean, it could even just be a PHP signature on a work uh, archive with a timestamp. So if the PHP key gets leaked, you can still validate it. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's like that. That's. That, that is a piece of internet infrastructure in air quotes because it ultimately is just a service that has become very important, at least to people trying to sift around and get through whitewashing in, in things. But like, you know, we've seen over the last few years, like there are instances where the archive disappears or the DMCA request makes it go poof and... <laughs> That kind yep. of brings into question the utility there. Yeah. Oh, I mean, af after all, I was involved in a rather uh, expensive lawsuit where archived web pages, in particular tweets, were a very big issue. And sure enough, you know, at times, like the Internet Archive just disappeared thousands of them. And it's not really clear to me what actually happened. Is that a technical mistake? Is that because you know, the person I was suing had friends there? I really don't know. And you know, that's exactly the case where at least a distributed model where you can download a backup that you can then you know, validate later is really, really valuable. And as far as I know, nothing offers this, you know, absolutely nothing. There's quite a lot of archiving services out there, but none of them, as far as I know, will actually put a signature on a file that you can download. Mm -hmm. Well, this, as I recall um, from, from the TLS notary project, was an uh, issue with the banks, right? Because in theory, you could uh, download a copy of your online bank statement and uh, get the, the signature and timestamp it, but the banks themselves would never allow that to be any kind of authorization on their part. 
Yeah, and, and I've independently heard the same thing where, you know, they really do not want to create third-party verifiable proof like that. You know, they always want there to be some ambiguity. And indeed, I've, I've heard the same thing about, um, you know, sort of crypto coin projects, like centralized crypto coins. You know, I've heard you know, even like regulators complaining that they really don't want this auditability to exist because they want the ability to go change things without people being able to know or, you know, being able to prove it. And the, there's a lot of kind of con conflicts there with the uh, cryptographic reality. That's actually something I never heard. I kind of just thought it was just an innocuous take this away. And um, <laughs> there wasn't any particular reason behind it. <laughs> that yeah, no, I, makes sense. I, I mean, I, I've been to a lot of conferences with, uh, people who might not show up at Bitcoin conferences <laughs> and, you know, talk, I mean, especially a couple of years ago, like talking to some of these sort of regulatory and banking types was quite eye opening, you know, the way some, you know, and I shouldn't say all of them thought, but there's certainly a minority who see this stuff as a real threat to their ability to go do things, you know, and, and I think also like some of it isn't necessarily coming from sort of a, an evil place, if you will. I mean, some of it's sort of coming from the realities of certain legal jurisdictions where they, you know, courts just expect to be able to do things like say, well, just arbitrarily change that, you know, like don't tell anyone that you've arbitrarily changed that. You know, it's like uh, kind of like publication bans where, I mean, can't, you know, my country Canada is an example where courts see fit to just order people to go and never publish certain things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is a nice transition to another um, use case of open timestamps that's pretty fleshed out. <coughs> Janine. <coughs> Hello. Hey. A lot, of, a lot of fake news uh, being circulated. A lot of ninja editing in the media these days, isn't there? Well, I mean, speaking of... Uh... Speaking of, weirdly enough, people who don't want tools like this to exist, um, I think that, I mean, I don't know how many, because I don't think a lot of them have looked at it yet, but I think, I get the sense that there's a lot of journalists who don't want verifiability either. They don't want to use it themselves because that would expose them <laughs> if used it, and they would have to be extremely, like, extremely careful not to expose themselves in some way using it, whether that's open timestamps or Git or anything that, you know, kind of gives some accountability. But I also feel like they don't want it to exist in general because if other journalists use it, then, you know, that makes them look at least a bit more honest. Uh, you know, they've put in the work to make something verifiable, whereas they're not. So <laughs> I haven't really heard that, but I, I feel like that's part of the lack of interest. I think in terms of sort of verifiability in journalism, all you really need to know is that the vast majority of journalists don't cite what they're talking about in their articles. Like yes. Right there, that tells you immediately they have no desire to actually have verifiability. You know, as if they're not even willing to cite basic things like, well, what medical study are you actually talking about? You know, what tweet are you actually talking about? You, you really have no commitments to this kind of accuracy and transparency to even begin with. Yeah, part of the presentation that I uh, was supposed to give um, Monday that didn't end up happening, uh, uh, one of the slides was, uh, uh, weirdly enough, a screenshot of a blog post in the Scientific American, which is weird enough that Scientific American has a blog. But the article was about how to find um, studies and journals that news organizations mentioned in their articles but didn't ever link to or really cite at all properly. And yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's the reason that I started doing what I do is because I was so angry that not only it was, I don't think it was even just laziness, um, as it says in the, that article that I cited, a lot of media have a policy of not linking to sources for whatever reason, either because they don't want to lose traffic to other websites 
or <laughs> strangely enough, because they're afraid that if people actually look at their sources and see how bad they are <laughs> in some cases, that they, you know, they'll lose credibility, which is an interesting fear <laughs> to me. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think the just losing traffic by people clicking out is part of it. But, you know, as I've kind of looked into journalism more and actually, like, sort of, if you will, reverse engineered those citations myself, you know, I, I absolutely believe it's, uh, I mean, I, I guess what you could kind of describe it is this sort of kind of lazy fraud that I think a lot of journalism has gotten into where they knowingly lie to people. Not so much because they have any particular agenda, but rather because that's just a lot cheaper and a lot more effective. You know, if you're always willing to twist the truth to get a better story, that'll get more clicks. And you have a culture where, you know, because of competition, where that kind of becomes acceptable. Well, you're going to have a lot of measures to make that easier to get away with. Yeah, the culture is a key part of this, right? It's the fact that people are just trusting these publications rather blindly and are not actually themselves following links. And there isn't a big enough community right now of fact checkers because, you know, you need to fact check fact checkers. I understand that there are companies, often we don't know who they are. We know that Twitter claims to outsource uh, to a bunch of fact checking companies, but then who's holding those to account? Although... A point I would make with that, is I don't think this is so, you know, I don't think you can quite so easily just say, you know, this is people trusting this stuff. I think what's actually, you know, a bitter description of this is journalism has just shot itself in the foot because people don't trust it anymore on a wide scale. Well, that's and... happening. Yes, I, I agree that, that that is a transition. And in a, in a way, you know, as somebody who reads a lot of philosophy, I sort of see that the latest trend, like fake news, is really just a democratization of Cartesian doubt. I mean, that they're, they're finally catching up with an idea that a French dude had a few hundred years ago that set philosophy into a little tailspin as like philosophers went around in circles saying, oh, shit, we can't disprove this. We can't invalidate cogito. And what on earth are we going to do if we don't know that the world is real? I mean, eventually, philosophy as an industry kind of acquiesced and it just sort of quietened down in the mid sort of 20th, late 20th century. And now everyone's obsessed with consciousness. But now the public have caught up with the idea that, um, well, what can I really know? And but you, you still are seeing like these fringe communities. You, you end up with like this extremism because they're not professional philosophers, they're not trained in logic or, or reasoning. They end up going down these stupid rabbit holes and they, they think that the world is flat because, you know, you can't disprove it. You end up wasting a lot of your time. And actually the energy I would say that needs to be spent is actually validating the claims that are made in these publications. And that's part of the culture I think that is missing. Well, uh, the maybe where I disagree there is validation's all well and good, but getting that validation to mean anything's really hard because you're up against a public who part of them do, in fact, you know, trust journalism, but they sort of trust journalism because they want to, not so much because they actually have reason to. Yeah. And then I'd I mean say another part has such severe mistrust, it's very hard to kind of build up trust in any way. And between those two, you know, between you know, between those phenomenon, you know, what what is your validation going to do to media organizations who make their money essentially selling clicks to people who want to believe? It's, I mean, it's it's really hard to kind of make a dent in that because it's also broken to begin with. You know, I think where 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 this has the most benefit is in converting more people from the side of want to believe to actually thinking for themselves a bit and realizing how you know, how much of a lie all this stuff is. Right. But that's kind of a slow process, and there's a limit to how far you can go because there are a lot of people who want to believe. Right, you've, you've hit it on the head, yeah. It's it, people read the publications that they want to believe. Like in the UK, we have Daily Mail readers, right? They, they read the Daily Mail and they choose to believe it because it suits them. It suits whatever uh, agenda that they were already invested in. In, in. One of the real ironies, I think, with that is on some topics, the Daily Mail has been doing really great reporting precisely because their audience wants to believe certain things. And in certain cases, reporting stuff accurately actually goes and fits, you know, that kind of narrative that, you know, those people want to see. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested to hear more from Janine about, like, what 
she thinks that um, how how your particular tool can be used in journalism today. And I'm also interested in particular to know how much of an issue is uh, the, the, the tracking of the version of the authoring of the document? Because I don't know in mainstream media how often it, it is an issue uh, that a publication changed some wording on a website without notifying people. I know that Coindesk has been guilty of that, and these kind of amateurish kind of crypto publications have, have, have been a bit shady in that way. But how, why is Janine the 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 tracking of the version of the authoring of the document actually uh, important? Um, well, there's a few th things. Um, I because at the moment, I mean, unless you're you know, unless you're on GitHub and you've you're watching the repository, you don't really get notifications, um, and those notifications are kind of not as useful because you're getting notified every time I make a change, and that might not necessarily be a meaningful change. It might me might be just me uh, fixing a punctuation error or something, and so I think the notification part is still. Uh, that's like still a work in progress. That's actually something that was mentioned um, in the one of the books I were, uh, used for research was Trust Me, I'm Lying. And the reason I like it is because it's written by a media strategist. And most of the book is about how he exploited the media and kind of their biases in order to, you know, promote stories that would make him money to promote people that were paying him etc. But it's also about how the media was exploiting their readers. And so when journalists are looking at my model and saying, like, how does this fix trust? Like, I have to keep telling them it, it doesn't. Like, it's a tool and it helps you appear more trustworthy. That doesn't mean you are trustworthy. Like, being trustworthy is a relationship. It's not It's not a button that you can just press. Um, so the, the, I mean, the I think the main, I would say that the biggest value of the versioning, at least from my perspective and the authors, is more to do with being able to transparently see who contributes to story, which you very rarely get. Um, the the markup has been doing more of that. Obviously, they're not doing anything with Git or like any proofs uh, of any kind with signatures, but they at least have a credit section where they're listing off everyone who is contributing, whether it's just the byline author or the person who did fact checking, or if there was a video, they pr helped produce the video, they're giving credit to everyone involved. And I think that's a good step in the right direction. Um, with my investigations, uh, well, some of it is a bit weird because, you know, there, there have been people who've created GitHub accounts just to, I think, make a, a commit, to, a pull request to my repo, and then they delete their account later. Uh, so that doesn't help too much. All you can really see is that, you know, this defunct account made a change, whatever the name of it was. Um, so that's not as helpful, but I think in general, like, there haven't been too many people who've made direct changes. Most of them have um, opened issues, so... I think the authoring more has to do with going more in the direction of journalism, trying to actually give credit to people who do work on a piece. And also, what about, because you're using uh, Peter Todd's tool, right, for your investigations. I mean, you mentioned that maybe we should put a link in the description to, to your Git repo. Um, well, this, is, this isn't about me, but yes, uh, Peter has made. Yeah, um, but, it's, but it's a use time case. Stamps. I mean, it's a use case. So, I mean, we can we can riff around that, right? Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing with um, you know, Jeannie's particular uh, repo is that it's effectively timestamped by GitHub every time she makes a commit, because the you know, usual way I know you make commits is through the Git uh, GitHub interface, which GitHub actually is PHP key signed. So what I was mainly yeah. doing with the open timestamps timestamps that I've added to that repo was to rule out um, this future compromise um, scenario where if, you know, GitHub leaks their keys or they get compromised or something, you know, it's, it's to be good to be able to verify those signatures. Mm -hmm. I think that is a huge um, useful case for this in pretty much every realm, <laughs> like journalism, um, you know, interactions, 
so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> certain emails that we can't mention without getting our YouTube channel in trouble. <laughs> but I think it also the, the one of the values of um, verifying and doing the version control on the authoring of the document is that it makes it a lot easier for fact checkers to come in and see the provenance of the the data and the evidence that was used. In, in fact, in philosophy. In, in media studies, there's a term, I think it's called leveling. Um, leveling is what news anchors do when they give you a story, but they don't explain to you, like they might say, a particular militia in this particular rogue you know, state. And they'll talk about it as if they've always understood the local politics there. They talk to you as if they're experts in it, when actually they, they may have only just learned it themselves, for example. That's called leveling. Um, and I think one of the, the sort of potentials for this sort of form of, let's say, version control or scientific journalism, perhaps we could call it, is that anyone could be a fact checker. All you really need to be is motivated and diligent. You just need to go through the, you know, the versions of the document. You can say, okay, they use this this uh, piece of evidence here, or that it was deleted in this version, but I can see how they arrived at these conclusions. And perhaps it could be, you know, used in that way. And it's interesting how. There's sort of this perception that fact checking has been this very professional thing, when in reality, you know, most of it's just looking up some really basic sources and just seeing what contradicts each other. It's it really tends not to be very difficult. But right, it, you know, without that kind of evidence trail and the citation trail and so on, it becomes a lot of work that doesn't really need to exist. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, in that line i find the versioning to be useful in terms of you know anyone who wants to see what it looked like at any prior stage in time can just go back and it's not a great proof of like oh this is what the author knew at the time cuz it's possible that i you know held on to things and didn't add them until later until it was relevant but um i mean you kind of get that when the time of the commit is very close to the um, date that something was archived, for example, that can sort of show that it's kind of in a soft way. But I like the fact that anyone can go back and see what it looked like at a prior stage in time just to know, like, this was the information that people could have had at the time if they had had this investigation. I think that's really useful, though, in, in a way like Chris <clears throat> is nailing on the head, just in terms of for normal people who don't usually dig into or verify anything. Like, I, I pay very close attention to politics, and most of my history with my family are, are people just going, oh, but what's the source here? And then the mountain of work existing for me to go find that, to show them something, to get them to take something seriously. If all of that is already there, like it's not just me as the person fact-checking who's benefiting from that. It's all the other people who immediately demand, like, where's the source that I can just go grab and throw in their hands too. You know what I mean? I, I think you're kind of underselling the, the potential usefulness there, Janine. Well, a point I'd make with uh, versioning is, uh, I, I think one of the places where it really had, you know, shows more values, ironically, in, in the less well cited journalism, you know, such as say, you know, like the New York Times or something, because it lets you so easily see how accurate um, articles actually are. But then the irony of that is, I, I think what we're seeing is they're you know, they're realizing they really can get away with just changing things on the fly because the audience who they're selling clicks to doesn't really seem to care. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's good for the higher standard, but where it really works is ironically the types of journalism that have such low standards to begin with. Yeah, that was uh, when I had a, an impromptu uh, Jitsi meetup after the talk didn't work out um that was one of the questions i got was you know what if what if a journalist doesn't want to use version control throughout the entire time that they're writing their investigation either because they're 
afraid of, you know, including something at an early stage that they then want to remove later that's, you know, really sensitive. Maybe it's a source name who decides they don't want their name to be public, something like that. And, you know, I said, it's perfectly fine for someone to not use this model all the way through. The original inspiration for it was to at least do it from the point that you publish so that if you make changes after the fact, then that is at least visible because that was that's what most people are concerned about is that they read an article, it comes out, it's breaking news, and then they change it later after they've made a mistake. And it's good that they're making corrections for mistakes, but then it's hard to trace back where where the error originally spread from if the article that started it is now not the same anymore. That's mentioned from a tech point of view. Nothing stops you from simultaneously having version control and the ability to permanently delete things. You yeah. know, if you have a version control document that the technology allows you to permanently delete things, all that means is the version control will just say, yes, there was this version, and this part of that version is being deleted permanently. And you know, there's no longer a way to get a copy of that. Equally, if you publish anything at all, obviously people will be able to go and archive it and get a copy of it later. That's just reality. Yeah, that has been the case with um, the archive services. Um, and I think that's really, that's been the you know primitive way that readers have been able to hold media to account when they've made changes as if someone happened to grab it at that point in time when before they made the change. Um, but yeah, it would be better if it was embedded in the actual piece and it wasn't readers having to chase down an archived copy because like unless you know how to use those i mean i i've i'm pretty familiar with it but i've come across a lot of people that they they don't even know how to archive something because the website has become i think a bit more complicated um there's like several more steps now to actually archive a page i don't know if that's deliberate or just some part of their flow that they d disrupted but um i feel like a lot of people uh even if you have that they don't actually know how to use it properly yeah absolutely but yeah archi archives are uh like that are amazing because there's been so many times where um i've i mean i think it's just interesting and i was actually more excited when i found the internet archive than i was finding bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> because, wow uh, because i i was like oh wow wait so you can see prior versions of websites you can see websites that have been you know deleted that's great i can i can read someone's old blog that they thought was gone from the internet that's pretty good nice. well i mean it's a really like crazy thing but like you know i think like all all the topics like we, we've been touching on as far as the usefulness of these types of tools with journalism and publications i mean like just to kind of broaden the topic a bit, like think through applying this to legal documents, to public records, to any kind of authoritative uh, decision made in the public aspect of life. Like th th these can bubble out so much further than just journalism. Well, it's interesting. Apparently there is actually a big problem um, in legal records, and I don't just mean, um, you know, like legal cases, but like official legal texts and legal rulings and stuff, where there are a lot of modifications made after the fact for things that should be just grammatical and other minor errors. But, you know, fairly often they turn out to actually have pretty serious repercussions because they've changed things that actually affect the substance of them. Mm -hmm. And it's, just, it's amazing how they just don't put it on a Git repo, at least. Well, I mean, it's just all, all these little niche things like, the, you know, y you make a lot of good points about incentives to not use tools like this in, in some, you know, fields or aspects of society. But I really feel like it's inevitable in all of them that the pressure from the the mob so to say just keeps building up to use this i mean you know like i said earlier in the show that there is just so much potential with extending 
open timestamps or timestamps in general to so many different use cases, how the hell does this not eventually just become an important protocol in the internet stack? Well, it's interesting how with a bunch of the data being collected um, with COVID, people have been, in fact, been using Git, which, you know, may not have the same cryptographic guarantees as open timestamps. But even that's a huge improvement over the traditional ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, that is a perfect example. Like, there have been a lot of material policy um, changes made based on data that usually start finding a lot of problems with. Yep. So, Peter, I think it's time, man. Well, it's I time for uh, me to uh, finally uh, get proof marshal shipped. Yeah. <laughs> Time to defend your attack on the supply of Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, that's easy. Because uh, Bitcoin security right now is, uh, you know, partially based on inflation. So why would you want to go change a thing that's obviously working? <laughs> because it doesn't guarantee censorship resistance. But inflation won't hurt anyone. You know, 0.5% inflation, that's approximately zero anyway. Yeah, but if you have, you know, a permanent subsidy that miners can latch on to, then the fee guarantees, um, you know, creating censorship resistant incentive uh, alignment there, it starts falling apart. Yeah, but if, if it doesn't fall apart, then that's all well and good. And if it does fall apart, wouldn't you really rather have an inflation subsidy to go make Bitcoin still somewhat work? Like, in no incentive will the inflation subsidy make the fees subsidy fall apart. You know, I'd you'll always be able to die. go pay fees. You'd rather watch them die. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, crowdfund some uh, Bitcoin donations for you so you have more incentive to keep it uh, working. Did you just try to bribe me to support it, increasing the supply? <laughs> Despicable. <laughs> That that was absolutely despicable, Peter. I I don't think I can continue respecting you anymore. Oh, even worse. I want to go grab miners to get them to continue mining Bitcoin. I just don't know who I'm talking to anymore. <laughs> well, how do you know? I mean, it's not like this conversation is cryptographically signed. You could be talking to some GPT-2 bot with good voice synthesizer. That's what people say about me. Oh, I know you're not real. I mean, I've met you. You're definitely not real. Bitcoin has been infiltrated by Skynet. <laughs> I, speaking of which, I have this uh, I have this silly idea coming up called 12 Days of J9 where I tweet out um, pictures of fake women from this person does not exist dot com. Nice. <laughs> to confuse the algorithm because I feel like it. Speaking of, um, have you seen the site uh, This Person Does Exist? No, but I feel like that's related to the, uh, what is it called? Clover or something? Clearview. Well, so this person doesn't exist is, of course, AI-generated ones. This person does exist, just republishes all the faces used in the data sets to uh, train the AI. Ah. That's creepy. It kind of is. <laughs> I mean, my, because some of them can get like really weird. My favorite one is the one where it looks like she has a nose ring. I've actually used it in a few places, but one of my favorites is one where it looks like she has a nose ring, but actually it's just a glitch around her nostril. Uh, it nice. was just a, the perfect, the perfect glitch and it looks like a nose ring. Yeah, for, for at least now we, uh. We still have the advantage that uh, these AIs don't really understand physics. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. The whole class of things that are not fixed with time stamping when deep fakes run amok. Yep. You can definitely tell that it's been trained on human faces a lot more than other things because the variations of, like, this cat does not exist, this horse does not exist, the, those are very... Like the quality is pretty low on most of those. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, this whole class of stuff is why I think it's so damn important to really start baking open timestamps into things now. 
while we can start making anchor points where everybody can't just go deep fake, deep fake, deep fake, deep fake. Well, I mean, that should be the new take line for open timestamps. Reality anchor. <laughs> I'm already thinking of memes to pun your reality anchor. <laughs> well, well I'll, I should make that uh, the commercial. The open timestamps logo is, of course, a, is a stylized clock. And the Proof Marshall logo should be a big anchor. I mean, I'm excited to hear that you're actually working on something with that, man. Like, that talk when I first watched it was damn fascinating. And then, in usual fashion, you just kept talking about things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. So, I'm pretty much plumb out of substantial things to talk about. How, how are you feeling, Peter and Janine? Well, this got a bit over the hour I allocated, so uh, I, I got ahead. But uh... I'm going to cut out the argument about um, the the supply cap, Peter, and I'm going to shame you on Twitter <laughs> for a day or two before I publish the full interview. Shinobi, nice. we don't cut things. We yeah, it would break the timestamp proof. Yeah. <laughs> Hell, maybe I'm recording this, and I'm going to go shame you by cutting stuff. <laughs> Well, game on. <laughs> well, next time we should talk about uh, forensics because I am interested in, like, you know, live broadcast, you know, sequential time stamping. I used to work in the film business and there are lots of ways that you could prove the validity of a sequence of frames. Um, so that, that's a rabbit hole. I didn't take us down it today, but it is an interesting topic. Well, you get interesting stuff like, uh, you know, validating... Uh... 60 hertz hum for instance right you know making sure that it, it, it's actually there and in the right phase and so on yeah that would but actually next time, be next time. A, an interesting hole to go down to if i can twist your arm to come back later peter well i uh, used to analog electronics design so uh, in fact like one of my first uh, things i want to do with open timestamps was to timestamp recordings of uh, 60 hertz hum mm-hmm yeah, I mean, you might need to get out more, but yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I grok you. I grok you. <laughs> we all well, need the, to get the, out more. The, the neat thing with it is if you, if you have a good recording of it, it then makes it easy to do signal processing later to then go and better fake uh, an audio recording. Yeah, yeah. I, find, I, find, I find it fascinating. And I think, I think that it has not yet been realized, like uh, engineers haven't yet realized the potential of that and, how, you know, why that might be why that might be useful i mean ccd arrays and the cmos sensors have their own signature you know you can look you download a digital image as long as it has been compressed too much you can actually say specifically which camera that came from so long as you have the, the pattern that the cmos had when it was first manufactured yep yeah well, one of the few ways around that essentially um use the highest resolution video camera you can get and then uh down sample it yeah Yep, this is definitely a rabbit hole. That is yeah. for sure. So that's why I didn't want to talk about it yeah. on an actual show proper, but yeah. yeah. But maybe another episode. <laughs> for sure. Well, all right. Cool. Should we I do our goodbyes uh... or what you want to do? Yeah, I guess it is uh, time for the outro. Hope it was interesting. Hope it was enjoyable. Catch you later, punks. All right, thank you. Uh... Bye. Lawler stands here in light.